Hey, it's Phil from Euroheat. And there's one critically important thing that you need to consider before choosing a geothermal heating and cooling system. Now, a lot of people come to us and they say, hey Phil, hey Euroheat, we want a geothermal system. And we ask, well, that's great, but why do you want a geothermal system? What is it exactly that you want? And usually the response we get is along the lines of, well, because it's the most efficient or the, the, the cheapest to run or you know the, the most environmentally friendly or sustainable option there is. And yes, most of that is true, but let me tell you a little bit more about geothermal just so you have all, all the information. First of all, geothermal, a lot of, some people get confused uh, because there is a few variations of geothermal. One which people think of a lot is hot rocks. And say in Iceland, they have a lot of heat towards the surface from volcanic activity uh, where there is basically heat from the inner earth being, uh, being, being expelled or you know, being emitted from the ground uh, close to the surface so it's easy to harness this energy. But say in Australia, generally to harness this type of energy, we actually have to drill kilometers and kilometers into the earth to harness these hot rocks or you know, this heat coming from the center of the earth out. So the most common type of geothermal or ground source application here in Australia and generally around the world is a closed loop type where it's either horizontal or vertical. Now let me go into this a little bit more. So the horizontal type includes pipes that are buried in trenches horizontally across the ground and this takes up a, a quite a lot of surface area. So for example in the southwest of WA we've done projects where it takes up say half a paddock or quite a few square meters and the pipes are buried at least a meter and a half below the ground and they're buried below the ground this far so that they aren't affected by the seasonal fluctuations in the local climate. So for example, uh, you know, in winter obviously the air gets colder in summer, the air gets warmer and also the top layer of soil or ground is affected by these seasonal fluctuations too. Whereas when you get below about a meter or 1.2 meters below the ground, it's quite stable and so it's not affected by the seasonal ups and downs. So this means all year round you are able to collect this energy from a relatively stable temperature source. And so with the vertical option, we are boring or drilling into the ground and we're using the same principle, we're putting the pipes into the ground, but instead of using up all this, this land, if, if you don't have it, say in the metropolitan area, we are using these vertical bores so we don't take up much space and the pipes are filled with the, the liquid as they are in the horizontal system and they exchange energy with the ground too. And these, the, the, the ground obviously vertically is also very temperature stable. So it's a great energy source for your heat pump. But this is the one critically important factor. So, so yes, geothermal is fantastic if you have the right machinery, the right setup. You have a great stable temperature energy source all year round. But the other side of it is that you actually have to have an energy efficient system in total, not just one part of it. So if we imagine that you have a geothermal system that is the energy source, but then you have an inefficient energy uh, distribution system or uh, emission system, let's say floor heating or air conditioning heating within a building and it's not designed, installed efficiently and it's in an inefficient building, you may be producing energy very efficiently, but you're using energy at such a dramatic rate and it's not doing a very good job at what it's supposed to do that the whole system becomes inefficient. And we see this all the time. So it is critically important that you have not only an efficient energy source, say the geothermal, but you also have an efficient uh, distribution method and energy emission method. So that means that you have to have a really well designed HVAC system, be it your hydronic air conditioning, floor or wall heating, cooling, your tap hot water or shower water production, your pool heating, whatever it may be. It all needs to tie in and work together so that it is one efficient system. Because as the old saying goes, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link and so if you have 
a weak link in, in your system, even though you might have a geothermal energy source, the whole system can be inefficient. So unfortunately, we get calls quite often to come and have a look and try and figure out why a system that someone else has designed and installed isn't working very well. Why it's costing the building or the client or the occupant you know, thousands of dollars per month for this geothermal heating and cooling system when they were expecting, you know, either zero bills or, you know, very small bills, say, a hundred or two hundred dollars per month. And most commonly, one side is okay and the other side is, is weak. But let me tell you about one particular project where both sides were weak. So there was a geothermal uh, heat pump where it had DX lines going to the ground, so that means refrigerant lines going directly into the ground, which we think is a bit of a no-no, but that's a, that's a different story. But the machines themselves were, were extremely simple, they had basically no controls, they were tripping out, you know, the client was getting annoyed because a couple of times a day they had to reset this system. And then uh, this was supposed to provide hot water for hydronic heating of the house and also for heating of the tap and shower hot water. And so when we had a look at this system, the geothermal part of it was 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 working okay to be honest it should have been working better but it was just uh, not the right setup not done in the right way but look it was working okay it could have been working worse but what was actually not working well at all was the hydronic floor heating and the domestic hot water or the tap hot water preheating so it was actually costing the client five or six hundred dollars a month in summer just to heat up the hot water. And so this particular owner of this house with this expensive geothermal system also had 10 kilowatts of solar PV panels on the roof. So he was expecting that the whole system was gonna cost him nothing, it was going to be net zero. And then after the first few months of moving in, he started receiving his first bills. And it was summer and they were about 500 or $600 a month. And he thought this was pretty crazy because all that was happening was that this geothermal heat pump system was basically heating up the hot water because in summer there was no heating of the house, of course. It was just heating up hot water and it was costing five or six hundred. And so he went through the whole sort of uh, elimination technique, thought that it might be this or that or that. But at the end of the day, he identified that it was this geothermal system. He thought that, okay, you know, there might be some bugs that have to be worked out. He got a few of the different contractors that were involved to come in and have a look. Everyone was just started pointing the finger at everyone else. Oh no, it's this plumber's fault. It's, you know, this uh, geothermal installer's fault, everyone's fault, but not theirs. So he got sort of sick and tired of it and he just left it for a little bit. But by this time it had, be, it had turned into winter. And then he started getting his bills, his energy bills from winter and they were not, Five hundred or six hundred dollars a month anymore. They were now over a thousand dollars a month, one thousand or, or twelve hundred dollars a month in winter, and this was with supposedly, you know, the geothermal heat source, but also hydronic floor heating, which is supposedly very efficient, and it is actually really efficient, but only if you do it well. So we got asked to have a look at the system, and uh, like we said, the geothermal system was okay, could have been better, but. Not only was the hydronic floor heating installed so poorly that it was just leaking energy like a sieve, not even heating the house properly, that it was basically useless, but it, it was producing this hot water for the house, but there was a ring main running around the house, pumping hot water throughout the house so that there's instant hot water pretty much from the taps at any point in time. And this ring main was installed and some of you might not believe this, but it was installed throughout the slabs, throughout the walls, throughout the whole house, uninsulated. So when the hot water was running through, by the time it would come back, even though you know, there was no taps being opened or anything, by the time it had come back, it was 11 or 12 degrees less in temperature. And so if, when we did the maths on this, when we did the calculations, we figured out that this is basically in summer where all of this five or $600 a month was going and it was crazy just because of these few simple mistakes. So once again, geothermal systems are fantastic, but only if they are also combined with an, an efficient heating and cooling system on the, on the secondary side. Because 
if, say, just one part of it is inefficient or ineffective, it can bring the whole system down. So if you'd like help with your geothermal heating and cooling system for your uh, house, for your commercial building or your in industrial process, give us a call at Euroheat. We've been doing geothermal systems since 2005 and we love doing the geothermal systems, combining them with heat recovery as well to help make your systems really energy efficient and your buildings comfortable.